Hi, I'm Katie Crane, and this is the Pilates Lounge. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Crane, the Pilates professional. Welcome to another episode of the Pilates Lounge podcast. I'm super excited today. I've invited onto the show somebody who I consider one of my mentors, Madeline Black. Well, I have to let you know before I even introduce you. I came to a few workshops with you in Bali when you were hosting workshops there. And I have to tell you that when I experienced your workshops, it was the first time that you allowed me to get creative with the work that I had learned. You know, like when I learned Pilates, it was very systemized and and that system definitely works, you know. It was very systemized and I followed rote by rote what I was told to do and it's something magical was happening. There's no doubt about it. When I was working with clients, I didn't necessarily understand why that magic was happening. And when I came to your workshops, not only did you help me understand why it was the magic was happening, but you also almost allowed for creativity to be a part of what we were experiencing and what we were going to be sharing with our clients in a way that not only opened up my eyes to the possibility of Pilates, but were also so good at really delving deep. And it was very obvious to me when I went to your workshops that you had done so much research and you had so much experience under your belt. So I'd like to thank you for that. I don't think I've ever told you that. But I'm going to introduce you now. (laughs) So Madeline Black, (laughs) your life pursuit has been in the discovery of how the human body moves. With over 35 years in the field of movement, your curiosity explores all aspects of human movement in dance, Pilates, yoga, gyrotonics, fitness training, and from studies of human biomechanics through human cadavers, dissection labs, osteopathic, and manual therapies. Madeline Black is the author of the book Centered, organizing the body through kinesiology, movement, theory, and Pilates techniques. And this was first published in, 2000, um, in 2022. Madeline teaches five days intensives around the world and through the magic of the internet, her work is easily accessible online, but I definitely recommend you, if you're an instructor or a movement lover, take time out to go and experience in person the magic of Madeline Black. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Katie. It's so great to connect with you again. Mm, For sure. So I've got like an encyclopedia of questions for you. (laughs) So let's See how we go with it, but I know that whatever you share with us is going to be so valuable to our listeners. So our listeners are probably mostly, you know, Pilates instructors, but um, also new students of Pilates as well. So whatever you share, I know is going to be a really valuable part of their journey. So one of my questions is, you know, there are many ways that we can learn to instruct. So through face-to-face mentoring, online learning, further research, you know, expanding our own understanding, of course, through self-practice. But what do you think are some of the most valuable ways for us to continue to learn and grow as instructors? All those ways. Isn't it amazing now today, I think, that we have all those possibilities, you know, back In the beginnings for me, there was, we didn't have any of those opportunities. You really had to search out someone you were interested in working with, you know, and show up in person. And there were no books, no manuals, you know. And so some some teachers don't realize that, you know, you go to a training course now that's been fully realized and it's incredible. It's great because these programs, you know, give so much information and knowledge and experience. So the foundation for Pilates teachers today is so much better off having that foundation than just trying to find your way, which is what I had to do, which is why I just, that curiosity is beyond curiosity for me. It's, it's like, I needed to know, (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, it's needed to know how this is, how the body is moving and how can we move better and more efficiently and be stronger. And so, you know, I just sought out all the possibilities and then synthesized from that information and my own physical practice. I think the physical practice is very, very important. And a physical practice when you take a class, but just your own exploration, your own body, taking care of your own body and, and doing the movement yourself and making discoveries that way. I think that's really important. So it's hard to say which is ideal or what's the best for people because it's really individual. You know, some people live in a very remote area and they don't have a lot of access, you know, so online is great, but you miss, you know, that live experience, which is a conversation between whoever's taking the class and yourself. So, you know, it, it depends on where you're at in your training, but I think teachers who have, like you expressed, you had a program, you had a, you had a good training, you were able to teach people, you were getting great results, you know, but you were following a template that somebody created and taught you and it was working. But then all of a sudden, right, you have a person come into your studio and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, that's not quite working for that person in that template. <laughs> you know, what, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to, so it's that critical thinking part, but also being able to interface with a client and be able to sort that out together, you know, with the client. And so as a teacher, I think what I love about my five-day intensives, and I think studying intensively with someone is a really good experience because you get the feedback about your teaching, as you shared in the beginning. So there's questions and then questions come up and, and you know, it's, it's just a really great experience. I don't know what else to say about that, except for, you know, to get feedback on your teaching, someone's watching you, not like a performance, you know, there's a discussion, you have a body in front of you, you're, you're saying, you're verbalizing, this is what I'm seeing, this is how I'm going to approach it. And then I, you know, I say, well, then how about what if, you know, is that working? And what if we take another approach? And can you see the movement? What I find, Katie, a lot with um, even, ex even very experienced teachers, there's a, the magic I think you're seeing it talking about is being able to actually see movement, see the movement, see the tissue tension, see the changes, you know, in all of that. Uh, and that comes from understanding biomechanics, but nobody moves in the way biomechanics teaches you what that is. But we have basic fundamental movements that we do as humans. Yeah. And gait is one of them. So Early on, I got the gate bug through Marika Molnar and Jean-Claude West way back in the early, mid-90s. So it, it's a great format, I mean, to understand gate in terms of what the, the torso, you know, the force between your heel hitting, what happens through the body, how the spine adapts. And, and there are movements that are optimal, you know, there's kind of how it's designed. There's a basic design, even though all our bodies are different, our brains are different. So therefore we all adapt differently. So it's being able to see that, say, well, I understand, you know, what a human being, you know, this would be the way you would walk. And what I'm talking about is, you know, how the mechanics of like how the pelvis moves in like a figure eight and what is the adaptability of the spine with that eight and the thorax is different than the lumbar and the hip joints are very part of that. And of course the foot, you know, really is uh, calibrating the whole thing. So when you see that, and then you can use these little assessments to, to un unearth the fact that this person doesn't have a hip glide and that's what's changing their gait, then it's like, oh, now I can use my Pilates and I can start to, you know, amplify that a little more and be able to give them that ability to move. And then you check your work. You always check it after to see if it was effective. So, so it's that kind of in-depth work that I think there's a, a point for a teacher uh, that could be really valuable in their work. You know, there's a lot of choreography in the world, <laughs> lots and lots of choreography. You know, there's the J.H. Pilates choreography. And I say that because he had a repertory, right? Then he died. <laughs> and then, you know, other teachers who had worked with him, you know, and his wife and his niece and, you know, and they all had their own little spin. And then, you know, so it's like telephone, you know, down, down the line, you know, things evolve and they're working with different kinds of bodies. And, you know, so when I think of choreography, I think of, okay, there's the JH Pilates choreography that is in a book and we have pictures of him and we have videos of him, but that's all we really know. 
about his choreography. And then you have the choreography of the next generation of teachers that came, you know, and so then there's that choreography. What do you call that? You know, and now today with Instagram and all this craziness going on, <laughs> I mean, the reformer becoming a, you know, a gym piece of equipment and people just doing the most insane things. Like, how is that helping someone move more efficiently? How is that really changing someone's gait pattern? You know, doing these headstands, you know, on a reformer pulling a strap and whatever craziness, you know? So, I mean, so there's a ton of choreography. So as a teacher, I think if you're really looking to up your game and to really feel, I mean, it depends if you have that desire. There's some teachers that don't have the desire to want to learn more. That was one of your questions, like continue to learn. I mean, it's not like they don't want to, they want to keep moving, but they're happy in their little box. Like some teachers just want to teach math and that's all they want to do. You know, it's not, you know, they're, so, I mean, that's great. That's their choice. So, and they're not going to vary the choreography very much, but if you look at research in terms of physical training, and advancing your body, your client's body, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. The body adapts and then there's no progressive loading, no progressive advances, and there's no strength gains. There's none. <laughs> so, but some people don't know that. Anyway, so I, I think just exploring where you're at as a teacher, where do you want to go as a teacher? How do you want to work with people? And then seek out, you know, there's so many wonderful educators in our field out there offering really nice work. So that would be my advice. <laughs> Just a quick little interruption to say a big thank you to listening to the Pilates Lounge podcast. This podcast is all about sharing our love of movement and Pilates with as many people as possible. So if you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to review us so that we can get the word out there. Also, if you haven't joined us on the Pilates Muse newsletter it's a bi-weekly newsletter that shares a whole load of information with you and we also have virtual online education programs so if you're looking to get inspired and grow even more as a pilates professional check us out www.thepilatesprofessional.com.au back to the show yeah, sure. Well, and even, you know, when you talk about, you know, like the figure eight of the pelvis moving in the gait cycle, you know, if if somebody had told me that, you know, it even used those words when I was first a Pilates instructor, you know, I, I don't even understand, I don't comprehend what you're talking about. So I would certainly feel, you know, for my own, you know, self, for my own growth and self-development, and I'm also a curious cat, you know, like, what does that mean? And, but like, where do I start? Like, you know, for, as a new instructor, because there's so many new instructors out there, right? And, you know, like you can, you can pull out a certificate from a cornflake packet these days, you know, so wh where do I start <laughs> to understand the intricacies of what it is that I'm doing? Like, how, how important do you think it is for new instructors to have a mentor or community or guidance, you know, because a lot of, People out there are just getting their certificate online and then getting out into the world. And I agree with you, like, you know, okay, well, let's not, you know, bash them too much because movement is better than none, right? So, you know, they're certainly serving a purpose mm -hmm. in, in the world. But surely if you've chosen to take on Pilates, you know, surely you, you want the magic, right? You know, because the magic can happen. But how important is it to, ha you know, to continue to have guidance? Oh, I think uh, guidance, you know, from a mentor or, you know, even community use the word community because you can get together with your own teacher friends, <laughs> you know, and explore the work and ask questions and then use some resources. You know, I mean, could use my book centered, go from chapter one slowly through and get a study group together. You know, or just get together and be like, we're going to have a teacher's workout together. Let's, you know, let's play. Let's see how this, you know, and then start talking about my clients. Well, I have this client who's, you know, X, Y, and Z, and, and they're not able to, you know, whatever it might be. And then someone can give a suggestion or, you know, I just think that kind of dialogue. And I think that's where community comes from. And actually, if you get a study group together, it doesn't cost you anything except for your time. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you true. Know, but I think uh, they have to be a teacher who is curious and realizing because the more you know, you realize the more you don't know. That's kind of what happened to me. <laughs> so it was like, oh, well, then I have to do more of this. So, I mean, I went down the whole path of, 
you know, in the cadaver labs, I mean, there's nothing like being in the lab itself. You can watch videos, you know, you can look at books and pictures, but there's absolutely nothing like actually being in the lab. So I highly recommend any opportunity, at least put it on a bucket list. Not that it would be something you do first, but it's an amazing experience. So I highly recommend that for any movement teacher. But yeah, I would just, depending on where you are and what you're where you live, how you, if you can travel, do you have a family? Do you have kids you have to take care of? You know, I mean, there's so many things that Pilates teachers, we are, you know, we're working and we have family and it's a lot to try to find those opportunities. So yeah, plan ahead, carve out a time, make it your vacation. I mean, I, whenever I travel, I love going, you know, find a studio, (laughs) pop in, have a session, you know, but, um, yeah. So with your, like, you know, you talk about the cadavers, am, am I right in saying you've done, you did a bit of that work with um, Gil Headley, didn't you? Like, you know, the cadaver work, is Correct. that what, is that, can you talk a little bit about that? Correct. Yeah. Gil Headley has been uh, teaching uh, dissection for, oh my gosh, it could be 20 years or so. And he's got his own long story. You can actually go to his website. He has a lot of free videos and someone's like, who is this person? I mean, I would just go to his website and it's quite prolific and a lot of it's free. He does have a membership, but I first, I don't even know how I first heard about him from my friends in the East Coast, because he was doing labs in New Jersey and in the Boston area, and then he'd come to California. So I did three with him. He does week long and sometimes 10 days long. So, and it's, it's a lot of physical work. It's incredible. He just holds such beautiful space around, you know, the human form that's a gift and that human form being the teacher because they're teaching you. So it's a really safe environment for someone who might be like, oh, I can't do that. I can't look at a dead body. Like, I can't do that. Right. I mean, I was super nervous the first time. Like, I was just like, oh, my God, you know, (laughs) but he has such a beautiful way of getting you into it. And and then it's um. I also have gone to two other labs. They were, one was a week also in um, Ulm, Germany. I'm not pronouncing that right. It's U-L-M, U-L-M Germany. And that's where they have a, they had before COVID a fascia summer school. And that's Robert Schleip's group. And so they would do this um, six day. It, it was more like lecture, science. People were presenting their research papers Uh, There were breakout smaller group workshops, and then there was lab time. So it was a real nice, so this was a conference smaller than the big fascial conference that happens every two years, much smaller. And the researchers were presenting their research. So that was super interesting to to listen to. And then it was small enough that you actually interacted with the researchers. I got to know quite a few of the people and really was a remarkable experience. And then also Dundee in Scotland, it's outside of Edinburgh, about an hour and a half train ride, I think. But it's John Sharkey, and uh, they do, it's more of a three-day, you know, it's a little shorter. So it's a long way to go <laughs> to travel, at least from the United States, especially Australia, I think, you know, for just three days. I mean, that was, you know, but, and that was also lecture. That was more lecture and lab time. So it, that was a fabulous experience. But Gil does just 100% dissection. And then, of course, he's sharing his, his knowledge and his perspective about anatomy. You know, the anatomy, people have to realize what you study in a book is not really, (laughs) not really true. And what we're taught in terms of movement and what muscles are doing certain things, it's not really true. (laughs) So I, for a younger teacher, I would almost say, don't worry about memorizing so much about those muscles and that they do X, Y, and Z because it's not, it's just not how the body functions. It doesn't move that way. You know, they have all those famous muscles, piriformis, they all start with P, right? Piriformis, psoas, purgatory, they're all kind of these famous P words. And I mean, the poor piriformis, it really doesn't, it's anyway, it's, you have to look at the whole thing and understand the whole movement function and the whole body wise connections, you know, through the tension and the compression that happens with movement. And then of course the nervous system, that's what's creating the movement. So why the little tiny, if you saw the piriformis, it's like this big, 
<laughs> it's, I know you can't see it, but it's very small. And it certainly is harassed for doing things to the human body that is not happening. It's not he, she, it. Performance is not actually doing that. So when, you, when you're in the lab, this is what you realize when you start to see all of it live. So yeah, I wish that when I was a younger teacher that this kind of information was out there because I just struggled and suffered and made myself memorize origins, insertions and, you know, actions and planes and, you know, and all this stuff. And it's so not relative to what we do. I'm not a surgeon and origins and insertions actually don't really exist. So, because it depends on the movement you're doing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I went. I did, lab, that, I, highly I did that course in Dundee with John Sharkey as well. Like I did travel all that way oh, for three oh. days. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, my sister yeah. was in England, so you know it made sense to go over there. But I even three days, you know, like as somebody who has never spent time in a lab, that was for me three days was enough as an introduction to it all. Like I'd love to do more, definitely, but. Is it like is Gil is the same, you know, in the in the way that they maintain the the cadavers, you know, so they're so they're still very pliable, right? You know, they're not in formaldehyde, so you yeah. really get to yeah. see and feel. Well, there's fixed cadavers, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fixed ones and unfixed. Mm -hmm. So you know, it just depends on what the lab can get. You know, it's not easy to get human forms. Mm -hmm. You know, so now he's aligned with. So he's not teaching. It became. He did it for like 15 years or around where he was got access to labs, like at medical schools or dental schools. And he was able to purchase the body forms and then bring them in. And it was a whole thing. It's a whole legal thing with the universities. And, you know, it's just uh, it's very complicated. To And he did it for 15 years or so, you know, doing that on his own. And now he's found a home in the, I believe the name is the Institute for Anatomical Studies and it's in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And this lab has, it's amazing. And they have many teachers now teaching dissection. So they're yoga teachers and fitness people and chiropractors and just a whole variety of people leading groups. So Gil's not the only one there anymore by himself. And I recently went, last year I went, last year already? Let's see, February and April. Yeah. So I uh, assisted Gil on a big nerve project. Uh, so he calls it the nerve tour. He dissected the entire nervous system. It's unbelievable. So I was, uh, I volunteered to help and he immediately took me up on it. And then I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I had this opportunity. So it was quite the experience to see. And now he's touring the United States with it. So it's incredible. So you can do, so I want to say to younger students that the models that we have for anatomy, meaning books and certain people teaching certain ways of looking at anatomy, they're, they're models. So it's something that somebody created. We need a model to learn, all right? So basically it's carved. That's why the anatomy books, I mean, they never had the fashion in there. You'd see a ligament. And I don't know if you remember Yap, he was at Dundee, Yap Vanderwalt, right? he dissected for most of his career. And I don't know if he was, if you got to see him do that when he did the elbow, but basically he said, there's really only five true ligaments in the whole body and that they've carved the ligaments and it gave them names like the elbow, the end, uh, I think it's called the annulus ligament in the elbow. And he does a demo where he shows you, you can see there is no ligament there. And then he carves it and you're like, Oh my God, there's, it's like the inguinal ligament. There's no inguinal ligament. Really? It's carved. Yes, there isn't. <laughs> yeah, get on the body, you'll see it's not there, but then you can carve it. So a person who knows what it's, it can sit there and carve it. So yeah, according to, there's only five ligaments, true ligaments in the whole body, yet there's like, I don't know how many there are, I never counted, but but um, yeah, so the perspective, it's, it's, you think it's science. It is science, right? Anatomy is a science, but it's, it's also an art and it's a form and, and somebody carved. And so, yeah, just keep that in mind. And each body's a little different and that's what you learn in the lab. It's well, incredible. So where are these five ligaments? Oh, I don't remember what he said. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. Uh, I'll have to look that up. That's fascinating. And I guess because, you know, like a lot of like the models that we learn from, you know, and even, you know, the naming of these like individual muscles, I mean, that was specifically for surgeries, right? You know, it's, you know, so then they can identify mm -hmm what you know what's going to be 
you know, cut through, pushed aside or, you know, whatever they're going to do. It's not how the body moves at all. Like even when, when you yeah. do the cadaver lab and, you're, and, you, and it painstakingly takes a day just to peel away the first layer of skin and get to the adipose tissue before you even see the muscle right. and then you really can't. I mean, I was working in a group with Graham Scar, you know, who's written books on, you know, tensegrity and how the body moves. And he had to point out to me, you know, this muscle, this is that. And I'm like, I can't even see where one starts and one finishes. You know, it all just exactly. is the same fabric <laughs> that just went on and on. Yeah, if you look even like the psoas, right? It, it's a, I don't know if you got to see that as it comes up into the diaphragm those fibers are the direct so you look at fiber directions that's what's interesting the muscle cells so gill calls it's muscle tissue and muscle cells it's not muscle it's muscle tissue because it's part of the tissue right so i've also changed language so how you speak about anatomy and the language you use is really important but you can see where the psoas is running more like vertical right the fibers are running you know from your pelvis up towards you know, your diaphragm and the diaphragm is more like, uh, you know, it's like more of a, like an umbrella. So imagine an umbrella kind of hanging down and at the edge of the umbrella and those fibers come up, they just kind of match, you know, and they just continue. So you can peel away and say, okay, where's the psoas starting and where, or ending and where's the diaphragm ending? You know, where are they? Can I see where they're connecting? You know? So you know, I bet you one of the ligaments is the arcuate ligament. So the arcuate ligament is a thickening of fascia, you know, along kind of near the spine and around the diaphragm towards the psoas. And it's like a little stitch. It like stitches around the psoas and then stitches around the quadratus lumborum that's next to it. You know, but then again, I don't know if he would consider that a real ligament because you can actually kind of peel it away, you know. So maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. You know, it was a lecture he said, it, and I was there so many years ago and it just stuck in my head about the ligaments. But anyway, it's just fascinating to look at that. Uh, and also like, do you know what, a, what is that called? And uh, I'm thinking of like a pattern in knitting. Oh, I forgot what it was. But you also can see like in the front where the, the abdominal muscles come into the diaphragm as well. You know, the transverse abdominis in the front in the body. And that is more like a herringbone. That's the word I was trying to find. It's like a herringbone pattern where it comes into because... The transverse abdominis is running horizontally, right? It's it's the fibers are horizontal, and you got your umbrella coming down. So now that's more vertical. So the horizontal fibers kind of hit, you know. So let's say the the vertical fibers aren't all the same, you know, like your fingers. They're not all the same length. So actually, if you look at your fingers, you have your second finger, your th your third finger is longer, the next one shorter, the pinky shorter. So imagine like uh, if that's if that's vertical and horizontal fibers bump into it, it's kind of like a herringbone where they kind of knit together, where some of the fibers hit the longer one and then the shorter one. And uh, it's kind of interesting to look at all of that, to see that relationship. So, yeah. And then understanding those relationships really in terms of movement, you start to learn to see and feel if you're touching, you know, again, to me, the tissue tension and see where it's going. So extremely helpful. Mm. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us about your own self-practice? Like how important is your own self-practice as a movement educator? And can you inspire with us, you know, inspire us with some ideas for self-practice? Like do you practice Pilates or yoga or meditation or like or all of the above? Like what does it look like after many years of working with bodies? Well, so, yeah, so, you know, I've had a lot of fun with my body over the last, now I'm t my birthday's coming up. A lot of people want to know how old I am now these days. <laughs> Been around for a long time, but, um, you know, I'm turning 67 in, uh, in about two weeks. And, you know, I've had a lot of fun with this body <laughs> that I've been living in. And, uh, you know, I professionally danced and trained really, really hard. I mean, it's, that's brutal training. And, you know, and I was always wanted to be stronger and be able to breathe better. And, you know, so I've done it all. And, but I think the, what I'm trying to say is that right now, what's important to me is not perfecting a movement form anymore. You know, I used to want to take, because I, I studied yoga as long as I've studied Pilates, you know, I've studied gyrotonic almost as long as Pilates. Some people don't realize that, but 
you know, I started uh, with Julio back in like 90. My son was born in four, 94. So he was in a little basket. So it was somewhere around 94 to 95 is when I started working with the, that um, system. And they didn't have any organization, really. They had a studio in San Francisco with wonderful teachers and they taught and we took and he showed up and it was kind of like that. That was actually a luxury, I think, that it's like that, not such a big organization. But yeah, so right now it's because I have issues. We all have issues. And I think aging, you know, we start, the tissues change, your tissues change. They start changing in your 40s and 50s. I mean, and we could go on about, you know, hormonal changes, and but, you know, the actual fascia and the collagen, it changes. So when you're 20 and 30, you know, you're able to create more collagen in your body and it's really good, healthy collagen, but then it starts to get weird <laughs> when you start getting older, you know? So there's a really good research coming out of somebody that I really admire what she's doing. It's Carla Stecco, who's from Italy. She's doing incredible fascial research and she's focusing on not only hormones, but also aging with the connective tissue and what the fascia is doing. And I certainly feel it. I mean, I'm like, you know, I can't flex as well as I used to. I can't extend as well as I used to, you know, and I'm not going to be that, you know, 30 year old doing full back bends and, you know, rolling uh, control front on the, you know, I mean, uh, control balance, you know, into arabesque on the reformer. I mean, I, I, this, for me, it's like, I did all those things and it was fun because I'm a performer, right. A gymnast, you know, it's, I'm not a gymnast, but I mean, like, you know, you love doing that. I mean, I love leaping. I love jumping and turning and like all of that stuff, you know, and, you know, I just don't do that anymore. I'm doing things to really just sustain, <laughs> sustain my ability to move well. I want to move well. And that doesn't mean doing, you know, rollovers and things like that. I mean, I love rollovers. It's actually really good for my back because I can't flex very well, but <laughs> I didn't, that wasn't a good example, but I meant like, uh, you know, like a backward somersault you know, or something like that. You know, I'm just not doing that anymore, but I'm making sure I can stand, get onto the floor without using my hands and standing up. I'm making sure that I can, you know, also get out of being, feeling tense and have pain, you know. So I use a variety of movement to me. Uh, it's not all Pilates per se. Now, when you say Pilates, you know, are you talking about J.H. Pilates? I think people should start saying that. <laughs> this is J.H. Pilates. Pilates, you know, because he had his choreography. Okay. And then came, and then there are people who say, well, you know, if you work, I worked with Eve Gentry. So I can say, you know, I'm an Eve Gentry kind of Pilates person too. I worked with her. I met, and Kathy Grant took a couple of my courses. I mean, not the five day intensives, but she came to some workshops and I've talked with her and sat with her. And, but she was, uh, you know, at NYU, I couldn't get into NYU. I don't go to school there, you know, so she wasn't accessible. And I also, I actually taught a teacher training at Mary Bowen's studio. I never trained her, but she invited me to come to her studio. That kind of way back. I mean, I'm talking again, my son was just born. So I'm, I think it was 1995. She invites me out to her studio in Massachusetts and I had never met her and we didn't have internet or email then. So that means we're writing letters or calling on the phone, you know? So yeah. So when you say Pilates like today, what does that really mean? You know, it's, it's really hard these days, right? The client says, what do you do? I, I teach Pilates. Oh, is that that thing with a ball? <laughs> I get that a lot. I'm like, no, there's, and then there's a Pilates ball, right? It's like Pilates never used a ball. <laughs> so it's really, you know, so I think it's funny that somebody made a product called Pilates ball, but it's, it's not JH Pilates. That's the difference. So Anyway, so yeah, I have to mix it up. I feel endurance is important. Strength is important, you know, and having good fascial glide, if you want to call that mobility, but it's, it's good fascial glide. You have to be able to, yeah, especially thoracolumbar fascia has to really glide, right? So I focus on those things. So that's where over the years, my method, Madeline Black method, I was, because of COVID and I started teaching online, you know, really needed to have a name. You know, because I, what I was teaching is not J.H. Pilates per se. Now, we might do a saw on the mat, right? We might do, you know, we definitely, and, you know, different movements like that. And especially um, for COVID, there was no equipment. I wasn't teaching out of a studio. So everything had to be mat-based. So there you, therefore, you pull out the props 
and then you start combining things. But because I was teaching specific concepts, movement theories, you know, of gait and, you know, about the pelvis and the figure eight, then I, you have to create a movement class around that. So you, the, the person taking the class can move and experience that figure eight and what does it mean? And then understand the biomechanics of it and then talk about a, a client and then say, okay, let's look at this person. Well, do you notice they don't laterally flex in the lumbar spine to the left, but they do to the right and that left hip glide's not occurring there. And if you notice their feet, and when they turn and rotate, you know, their feet aren't adapting to the rotation that they're doing. So then what do you do? So then it's, you know, and then that's what I teach. I teach what then to do about it. And it makes you think about your repertory. You don't even need to learn new choreography. Think about the repertory. What would you do? Well, you could do, you know, a mermaid, you know, on the Cadillac, you know, get that rib translation going. You know, you can do the, everybody calls these things different things, but, you know, push through bar, saw around the world, you know, whatever these people call, you know, everybody's got a different name for that. But maybe you want to encourage thoracic rotation. But if you are rotating to the right, okay, that's a translation left of the ribs. So if you're doing that reach to the right, then your lumbars need to translate to the right because you're translating the thoracic to the left. So what can you do to do that, you know, with the feet on the vertical bars? How could you, if you push, you know, your right foot into the bar a little bit more than your left one, you can activate differently in the lumbar spine, which helps actually influence that rotation, the around the world or that exercise. You see, so there's, there's the force vectors of our equipment that I think a lot of people don't explore so much. It's one of my little workshops I'm doing now is forces that move us is what I call it. But it's all J.H. Pilates or, you know, repertory that everyone's familiar with, but then setting it up with the equipment and how you activate your hands and your feet into the apparatus to create the force that goes through the body so that you create that more efficient movement and the tissue changes. So if all of a sudden now my, if I test after my lumbar will laterally flex to the left better. So that's the magic right there. And it's not that complicated, really. And when you see you, it makes sense when you see it. It's, you know, it's, we're listening to words that I'm saying and someone can't visualize it or they can't feel it, you know, but as a teacher, when you're in the room watching someone do it and we're analyzing it and then you're on the equipment and you're feeling it, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because it's almost like there's, you learn that repertoire, but then when you, learn the push and the pull you know by using the machines by by accessing the machines to almost find more length in the limbs by pushing and pulling and then then feeling the entire fabric of all of the tissue moving that's it's a completely different experience isn't it yeah i, I know and but you know, like just using using You're just changing. i know i know i know so I, let's see this is what i'm saying about the anatomy Language is really important, right? So you're changing the activation, right? Because you're pushing and pulling. And therefore, that's a nervous system thing. And the tissue responds. And the whole body starts to change in terms of its um, relationship to the whole. And the tissue actually changes its quality. And it improves. And you actually create glide in the fascia. Yeah. And do you think when that happens, yeah, I agree, you know, like we, we can't change the length of a bone, right? Like a bone is it's yes. fixed, right. but we can change the shape. Of and there's no space. You can't increase the space between your vertebrae either. Feels like you do. I just, you know, these are cues we were taught way back when, you know. Yeah. You can, you know, change the shape or the, you know, or the, the way that that fascia and all of the, the fibers and the muscles and everything moves. But do you think that by doing that, is that does that hydrate the, the fascia to allow for the glide? Is that what's happening partly? Oh, yeah. Movement hydrates. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. The more that the relationship. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So then as we're getting older, is that part of the issue is that we start to dehydrate, the fascia dehydrates, and so then mm -hmm. we start to get feel like we get stuck yeah this is new i don't you know I'm waiting for carla <laughs> yeah to tell us more but from what i understand what i was saying about the collagen too it and the fascia starts to basically dry up mm. you know and the collagen is not 
a 20 year old collagen being, you know, recreated. And that's why older people have, I think a longer, and I feel it for myself too, the recovery time is longer, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I get really sore and I'm like, wow, I'm still sore today, you know? (laughs) So I think that's it, but this is a new research coming out. Okay. Yeah. So that's very exciting. So I'd say let's stay tuned and keep reading what comes up. But that's my intention in my personal practice, which is where we started with this conversation, you know, is that how can I, I have every morning I'm like, okay, how do I feel today? (laughs) I never used to do that. I mean, I was one of those people like, okay, I got to run my five miles, you know, and then I have to do my Pilates and then I have to, you know, do this and that, and, you know, not really pay attention to how I was feeling. And even though it's like, you know, toughen up, right. Just, yeah, the the run's miserable, but you'll feel better after, you know, (laughs) And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But no, now I'm being more like, oh, I am, I'm just listening to my body because it will tell you when it needs something. And I feel that people wait until your body's shouting at you before you actually do something to change the relationship of some of the tension and compression of it. Like an example would be like, you know, I don't, you know, you might raise your arm up for a second, you know, and then all of a sudden feel a little hitch or a little catch you know, in your shoulder. That's what I mean about your body talking to you. It's like, wait, you got to pay attention to that. You know, maybe the next rep, it's gone. Good. Well, then you just keep doing that movement. But then sometimes it's kind of always there. Then I pay attention. I'm like, okay, you know what, I got to get on my roller and I've got to use my blocks and I have to do some, you know, work with this, get my rib cage rotating better because my rib cage is not rotating better than therefore I'm getting this little catch in my shoulder. So it's kind of, that's how I look at my personal practice. And I move every day. Mm-hmm. Every day I do something. I'm lucky I have access to a pool. So I love to swim. That's nice. Do you think that, do, you, do we get, well, have you gotten better at listening to your body? Like, you know, like I feel like when I work with people who are in pain and I always wonder like, you know, how long ago did that start? Like, did your body, did you not listen to the mm-hmm. whispers that like you waited until the body was yelling at you, right? This is what you're experiencing exactly. now. Like, is that something that we've got to like come to terms with? Is it something that we've that we are meant to be learning, or like how do we? I think, how do I we think the it? the public. I think yeah. I think people in the world just don't know. I mean, they they don't even know that's something to pay attention to, you know. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's an education to our public, and I am gonna. I am working on a. I'm just an outline phase right now, but. I, I want to do a book for the public mm-hmm. with this very topic. I don't have a good title yet, so I don't know. It's just very beginning. I don't know how long it will take me. But, yeah, I'm on a mission to do that. And I think children from a you know young age should learn these things. I taught my son. He thanks me I don't know how many times every time I talk to him. He's like, because at work, he's like, Mom, I watch these people move at work. And, and he's not a body person. He doesn't really like, to, you know, he'll work out or something, but he's not, you know you know, he's not a sports person. He, you know, he doesn't really like to run, you know, it's like, so, you know, but he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to last longer in this job than these other people because I'm, I'm watching them move and they have such poor movement when they do this and that. And, you know, and it's interesting. I love that he's learned that from me, you Mm -hmm. know? So, and I think all people should know that. I think from a young age, that kids need to know that. And adults need to know that kids have issues too. (laughs) Their pattern, you're, when you're born, right? When you're, you're an embryo and you're growing, you have a pattern. Something's being laid down, right? Your legs are crossed or your side bent in the womb as you're growing. And, and then you come out and, you know, my son was actually born with a rectus diastasis. Wow. So it didn't come from being fat or pregnant or old, whatever. He, the baby, and he has a rectus diastasis, small one, but it's there, hmm. you know? And it was like, I didn't notice it, actually. I took him to a, uh, because he was kind of side, every time you held him, he would kind of fall to the right every time. He would just fall. And and I kept saying to people who would hold him, I'd say, please, please don't let him side bend like that. Make him side bend the other way. (laughs) I was always like, you know, and I used to play with him in the tub, you know, when he could sit in the tub and and one of his hips was tight. So his, his left knee would be up high, you know, sitting in Baddha Konasana or sitting, you know, with your feet together. Uh, butterfly kind of shape, you know, one knee was off the floor and the other knee was on the floor. And I thought, oh my gosh, I got it. So I would play a game with him and I would do uh, um, an MET technique 
And I'd say, okay, I'm going to push your leg down. Hold, hold. Don't let me push your leg down. And he'd go, oh, we'd have a little thing. And then he'd stop. And then I, the leg would drop. And then I would repeat and I would repeat and I would repeat and I would repeat. And now, you know, his, he was sitting and his, both his knees were on the floor. In fact, he got into doing Lotus when he was younger. He can't do that anymore. But anyway, <laughs> so, you know, as a parent, I mean, just kind of noticing these things. I think can be helpful for their for the kids in their life because you're going to grow and what and maybe you get into sports or you don't you know and you start having problems and then the parents are like you're too young you shouldn't have back pain yeah but and plenty of people do education. when they're young now goodness me we're seeing people oh, yeah. younger and younger it's almost like we're becoming less connected with the body you know like I feel like it's be, you know it's, it's very much environmental you know the less we are outdoors in nature connecting with the earth and with nature, then we're becoming less and less connected with the body. Right. I agree. Yeah. Do you think that our body has the ability to heal through movement? And what does that look like if we did, if we do? Yeah, of course it does. I think it does. It depends on what needs to be healed. (laughs) What is it that we're talking about? Right. I mean, like, and then what does the healing look like? A, A little example, which I wrote about in my book is I was 50 yet. I 50, I don't know. I was somewhere around there. Anyway, I was out hiking. We, my husband and I hike a lot. And so we were out on this hike and for a random, it just was like random. Like they, I didn't do anything. I didn't step weird. I didn't, I have good boots. I'm a good hiker. And all of a sudden my knee just seized up. It just was like, ah, and I was like, oh my God. I mean, it was so painful. And of course I was halfway, <laughs> I was halfway out. So I, I had to walk back. There was no other, no other thing to do. And it was just terrible. And of course, by the time I got back, my knee was all swollen and I, I don't have problems with my knees ever. I've never had problems. And so long story short, I ended up having a MRI and it's shown that I had torn a meniscus, right? So I'm not one of these people that runs to the doctor. Okay. So I waited for a while and I was trying to get the swelling down and before I had the MRI and I was doing my movement to, to get my knee functioning again, the swelling just wouldn't go down. And so I went to it. So that's when I had the MRI. So, and then I'm in the orthopedic, the knee surgeon's um, office and he comes in. Meanwhile, I'm standing on that leg. What he kept me waiting 45 minutes in the room, of course. Right. So in the meantime, I was exercising because I didn't want to sit in a freezing cold room for 45 minutes looking at a wall, right? So I was standing on that leg, the one I had torn, and I was balancing on it. And then I was doing some wiggly movements like off my hip and falling and standing up and like, you know, I was just challenging my knee. And uh, he kind of walked in and was like, oh, what are you doing? (laughs) Anyway, he said I had three choices. He said uh, he could do surgery, but he said 50% of people over the age of 40, have a torn meniscus and they don't know it. It's just a tissue tear, right? But you have no symptoms. You Everything's functioning fine. There's really, he said, you don't even know it. And then he said, and if I were to go in, he goes, I don't know what the environment's like. I mean, he's a good doctor, obviously. He goes, I don't know what your knee, if you start to pierce it, as soon as you go in, you know, it, it could just like osteoarthritis craziness could happen, you know, but he wouldn't know, you know. So you're risking that. And then he said, and I can only tell you, you have a fit. I can only guarantee you a 50% change. That'll be better. It could be worse. Or I'll give you a shot of uh, a steroid. And I was like, okay, thank you. Thank you for your time. I choose nothing. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I knew I had to get the swelling down, which really acupuncture really worked for me. And then I started working on my knee. And what people don't realize about the knee the key element is the micro movement of the knee, not strengthen your quads. <laughs> yes, you have to strengthen your legs. So that's a that's a mindset of a single muscle quads. It's the ankle, the rear foot, especially your, your inversion, eversion of your foot. It's your hip glide, which also means your pelvic fi- figure eight has to be functioning, right? So you have to take into consideration all of that, but it's the rotation of your knee that is key. And I had, I mean, I couldn't... Um, I mean, I did work on the knee flexion. It was hard to flex my knee. So when you sit, you know, when you sit on the floor and your knees are bent and your butt sitting like on your feet, right? Your hip, hips are flexed and do you know what I mean? I could, I mean, that was a no brainer for me. I could always do that, but I couldn't. So I started with two blocks, two big blocks under my buttocks and I would sit there in that knee flexion 
until I had some ease, no pain. I just would breathe and slowly, slowly, slowly made the block smaller, smaller, smaller until I was sitting with my sit bones on my heels and that part was fine. But then it was the rotation I had to get back. And there's a great little um, MET for that in my book. It's incredible. And it was a game changer for my knee. And I'm fully 100% functional. There's, I mean, I can do everything. There's no problem. But is it healed? Well, if I had an MRI, that probably the meniscus is still torn. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. not like it healed and it grew back. Maybe it did. I don't know. But I don't want to expose myself to radiation and to find out. So that's what I mean by heal, like herniated discs, like discs problems and things. I mean, if you're totally functional, you have no pain and, you know, blah, 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 you know, and you had it, you know, when you did it and you got rid of the pain and you're totally functional move, I call that healing. But if you had an MRI, it's probably still there. So I don't see what I mean. So when you say heal, it's not like, yeah, it's not like the disc is going to go back where it was. Though I have known of meniscus uh, going back that aren't torn, but are dislodged a little bit. I've seen uh, uh, I've seen someone put put it back in with their hands, and unbelievable. So you can change tissue with manual. Those are you know usually osteopath manual skills mm-hmm. you can do that. So, but yeah, yeah, movement's important because yeah. And I guess with healing, you know, I guess what you're saying, you know, and the way I see it is what it, what does it matter what you've got? What matters is what you're experiencing. So if you're comfortable, if you're happy. If you're pain free, then right. what does it matter? <laughs> you know, what you know, do, right. do you really need to fix the meniscus, or do you just want to be out of pain? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. If you're not in pain, then meniscus doesn't matter. But oh, that's that's interesting. Right. That I mean, I guess with the knee, with that knee joint, it's the it's almost, it's the middle, isn't it? Of you know, of the foot and the hip. So of course, what's happening in the mm-hmm. foot and the hip is going to have a direct reflection in the knee. Correct. And I guess even with that Correct. exercise. And, but see, if your pelvis isn't able to glide around on that figure eight, which is coming from the thorax, your thorax actually really drives the lumbar, which then will drive the pelvis. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you have to look all the way up. Mm-hmm. You know, Maybe it's a rib that's not rotating, which then affects your hip, which is then affecting the knee. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. This is what's so fun. See, this is where... Mm-hmm. It's like being a detective. Oh, totally. To me, that's, mm-hmm. it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it too. Yeah, and then I'm like, maybe did you have a backpack on and was that restricting the movement of your thoracic when you were going on that walk that day? You know, exactly. so where was that coming from? You know, the knee was just right. a symptom of the body. It, the knee was just the body speaking to you. Yes. And, you know, drink that exactly. damn water, lady. Get this backpack off my back. <laughs> <laughs> Or whatever it may be. Hey, can you tell us a little bit about your your book centered? Like, I mean, you know, that, that's a long time ago. Yeah, twenty twenty two was a twenty. Yeah, so I. But can you tell us about? Yeah, it, it's so that was actually the, it's the second edition. The first edition came out in two thousand fifteen, mm. and then it did well. And then the publisher asked for an, a second edition, which is great because the first one was black and white. Uh, they went low budget, so it black because they didn't know. Like, I don't want to put a lot of money into it if it's not going to sell. So it was black and white and the paper wasn't that great, you know, and all this stuff. And now the second edition is, it's gorgeous. It's, the paper is amazing and it's all color and new illustrations and there's videos that come with it and, and all of that. So, and what happened was, so you had COVID happen, <laughs> right? And then I kept working on the, on the second edition and then the publisher sold. So the new company that they have the same name but it's different owners. And what happened was is that deal happened just as my book came out in 2022. So I lost like a whole year of no promotion. No, I mean, like they didn't, they were just, you know, it was a big transition, really big for the company. So I feel like right now they're, it's, they're more together, you know, with all the handspring authors and the books They're they're the big company is now, you know, getting just more organized around it. So I feel like we're launching it again or something, but yeah. So it came, the second edition came out in 2022, but it's organizing the body. So I went from the feet up through, but also at the same time, trying to tie in a whole body perspective, which is really hard to do because you have to look at it. You know, I would say it's like Google map, right? You're going to, you're going to look real close 
at that picture of where the house is or the store you're going to. And then you have to pan out and look at the whole, you know, the whole town to figure out how you're going to get to that store. So it's kind of the same with the body where you kind of zoom in and zoom out. So, you know, I kind of do that throughout the book. So yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot in there. It's a, it's a big, that would be a good study group thing. But I have another book that's coming out in hopefully November. We don't know. We've been waiting. And I say we because uh, Elizabeth Larkham and I were asked, it was almost, I think, seven years ago, seven or eight, <laughs> by the first original publisher to help create a science-based book on Pilates. And both of our responses were, well, that's going to be a tiny little book. <laughs> Because there's not a ton of research and that some of the research that's there, it's not that great. So what we decided to do instead was we decided to ask, I think we, I think we have 24, I think it's 24 people. We reached out to a lot of people, but we ended up with 24 teachers that we asked them to do a case report on a health condition. And we use GATE as the basis of the assessment. So Elizabeth and I created what the methods and materials were going to be for a case report is a study of one person as opposed to a case a case study. A case study is many people, right? So it's very exciting. It actually, it was terrible to go through, but anyhow, it's, um, so we have, it's called Pilates Applications for Health Conditions, Programs and Perspectives. Um, the original title had case reports because we wanted it to be a science book, right? So if you have a case report, it's actually, but what started happening is that the teachers who did their case reports deviated off our methods and materials. So, you know, when you do a study, you have to be very precise and follow protocol step by step by step by step. You can't go off the protocol because then it nullifies the study, right? So unfortunately, quite a few of the teachers did follow the methods and materials so we decided, but they made beautiful programs and really good information. So we decided to drop the case report name and call it programs. So it's, it's a book of uh, muscle skeletal issues, cancer, neurological, you know, conditions. Um, incredible. I mean, it's just um, depression, you know, um, things like that. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So, so, but you don't know when it's going to be released? They say November. Okay, cool. That's hilarious. So you've got, because, you know, like you've asked Pilates instructors, right, movement educators, creative people to stick to something. <laughs> and then they all started to just do their own thing. <laughs> Typical, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all science-based. But what about this? <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, well, we'll uh, promote it on social media and things like that when the book comes out. Yeah, cool. I've got one more question for you. I've got many, many questions, but we'll be here all day, so I'm going to wrap it up. If you could sit down with your younger self, what message would you tell yourself? <laughs> hmm. Those questions are really hard to answer <laughs> because I guess the world was so different when I was younger, especially if you're talking about a younger Pilates teacher, you know, because I was kind of left and dropped in the forest with no map and uh, I had no... I had to navigate myself. I mean, there was nothing. There weren't programs. There weren't books. <laughs> you know, so I, it was a big navigation tool, but so it's hard because I feel like I navigated as best I, I could, you know, to learn and teach and, you know, to be that way. So I don't know, maybe breathe, breathe more. I probably should have been breathing more. <laughs> it was pretty stressful. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. You truly have been an inspiration to my professional and personal work. You know, the work that you do is so valuable. And it's, I mean, like you say, you know, what, what is Pilates? Nobody really knows what Pilates is. Goodness me, don't, please don't ever ask me what I do for a job because I don't really know. <laughs> you know, we, I know none of us can say. I know. We, we just like, we, what do you do? Well, I say, I, I, yeah, I say I'm a movement specialist. And then people are like, well, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's the beauty of what we do, right, is that it's, I don't know, I mean, I guess uh, what, what we do is cater to whoever w walks in the door. <laughs> that's that's exactly. the of what we do, you know. So thank you so much for sharing your insights and your history and for continuing to put out the work that you do because, you know, I, I think that as Pilates 
instructors, as movement educators and movement lovers, we are all so curious and, and we want to continue to grow so that we can serve our, our own community. Let me say one, one more thing. And I just, because you're in Australia, I will be doing a five-day intensive in Singapore oh, at the end cool. of August. <laughs> Oh, awesome. So I'll be close yeah, well, to you. Yeah, not too far away at all. Well, we will definitely, you know, post on the show notes, you know, anything. So, you know, any other information that you want to share, I'm pretty sure I've got all of that on the show notes anyway. And if I don't, then I'll email you and ask for them. Um, but if you've never seen Madeline in the face, in the real, then she is worth traveling across the globe for. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. Thanks for joining me. I'm Katie Crane, the Pilates professional, and this is the Pilates Lounge Podcast. Mm-hmm.